Thank you, Rick. Yeah, Rick and I have known each other for, as he said, for quite a number of years now. Um, we won't go how long, how far back that was, but quite some time at any rate. When I was, and I still am a body naturalist and botanist, but when I met Rick, I was a young and body botanist and naturalist. And Rick and I have had the opportunity to run around in the woods a little bit, look at things, and we both share that strong passion for the natural world. A couple of things that aren't in my bio, and those of you who know me know this about me already. I get really excited about my topics. And the more excited I get, the faster I want to talk. <laughs> but after a number of years of practicing, I, I try to remind myself to take a deep breath and slow down a little bit. But the other thing is I also, when I start talking a little faster, as Rick said, I have been in the Southeast my entire life. And the faster and the more excited I get, the more I speak in Southern ease. And you know what that means. Does it seem to go together? I can say that because from the South, think about talking really fast and speaking in Southern ease, those two don't seem to match up very well. But it seemed to work for me in some way. So. And I didn't say that. Too great. So when Rick asked me what I present, he's been after me for several years to, to come back and speak with the Native Plant Society. I just haven't had the opportunity or the honor to do so in several years. But I was trying to decide what topic I would choose to talk about. Rick said, you can tell anything you want to. I said, great. So I had some, some people who, who had seen the Trillium talk that I gave to the Native Plant Society, I don't know how many years ago, maybe probably close to 10 years ago, so down in the Greenville area. And I was talking with different people, and Dan Witten said, talk about trillium again. I said, okay, that sounds great to me. And several of you like, yeah, trillium would be a great topic. So we're going to be talking about that tonight. We're talking about trillium of the Carolinas. Well, technology, what do we do? Now the slides don't want to advance. What did we do? Mm -hmm. All right, we seem to be stuck on that slide. So what do we need to do to repair that? I'll tell you what, while Pam is going to get the technology going back there again for us to get it so that I can advance the slides so you can see the rest of them as I present. Um, I've had the honor of, over the last week to be able to do some roaming around in the woods in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. I'm also on the Blue Ridge Parkway and the Mountain Ridge Wilderness area, pretty much all along the Blue Ridge Escarpment. It's working here, but I don't know about up there. No. He's doing that, but it works here, but not there. Is it working on the computer screen? It was. So at any rate, I've had, you know, been able to roam around the woods for the past week or so to seeing what trillium are out about along with a lot of other wildflowers are out there. <laughs> and it's amazing. This is the time of year for wildflowers. This is their time to put on their show. The spring and, of course, the fall of the year. I think the fall wildflowers are amazing as well. But in the spring, is sort of a, a reawakening for all of us as well as the natural world. And so we go out and we see these beautiful trillium and other things, and it just helps to bring back, we've made it through the winter and, and here we go, this is our opportunity to go out and, and see life anew. And the Trillium is one of those that tell that story to you as well. And here in South Carolina and also in North Carolina, we have such a diverse topography and that topography, which is based on the geology, which Rick and I talk about often, that topography is gonna to create a lot of different types of habitats from the mountains, down into the beautiful Piedmont area with those prairies and meadows, um, even down to the coast of South Carolina along the salt marsh and the maritime forests. And yes, trillium species do occur throughout the state of South Carolina in all of the biogeographical regions. Of course, we have different species depending upon where you are, but we do have trillium statewide in North Carolina and South Carolina. And trillium is one of those plants that it's a little bit slow about getting started, but once they get started, they're around for the long haul. And one of the ways in which they get started and spread around is by, of course, like many plants, 
is going to be by Paul. And a lot of people think about the hymenopteran, they think about bumblebees and things of that nature as being pollinators, but there are several species of trillium that are pollinated by beetles. And then, of course, there are going to be those hymenopteran. This is one of my favorite photographs. It's just covered with pollen deep down inside of that trillium flower. I'm also bumblebees, as I mentioned, are one of the pollinators of trillium. But that's just part of the story. You've got to get pollinated first, and fertilization has to take place. And then if all goes well, you set fruit and you produce seeds. But now the next challenge for trillium is going to be how do I disperse my seeds? Um, and one of the ways in which trillium seeds are dispersed is by ants. We have this seed structure that's got this fatty tissue on it called the lysosome, and it's nice, full of nutrients and ants. <laughs> they come over, they gnaw open the fruit of the trillium, they pull out these seeds, they take them back, go down underneath the ground, and feast upon this fatty material that's on there, which, by the way, was the food of the new trillium, by the way, on the outside, because most of the lunch is packed on the inside. But a little bit other on the outside is part of that overall development. Once that seed is planted, then all of the nutrients it's going to need until it can make its song is all packed inside of that seed. Ants carry them about 25 yards on average. So if you think about moving 25 yards at its maximum potential every time that there's seed move, you're not moving around very fast. And when I tell people that plants move, they look at me like, what do you mean plants move? Of course they move. They, they just move slower than animals. I heard Rudy Mankey say once, you know why plants don't move quickly? They don't have to. They can make their own food, most of them. Things that move around a lot, they've got to collect and gather them. The plants, they just make their own. So they don't really need to move around very quickly. Of course, there are other things that disperse the seeds of trillium. Um, yellow jackets being one of those. They're also after that same alliance on the tongue there. They can move a little bit further, 75 yards on average, so about 25 yards for the ant dispersal, about 75 yards on average for the yellow back dispersal. So you think about that, once again, these seeds aren't really being moved any great distance quickly. However, Dr. Tim Spear, when he was at Clemson University, he was working with one of the graduate students and doing some DNA work and following the movement of these trillium. Of course, they're going 25 yards, 75 yards, but they were finding some of these trillium with the same genetics over a mile away. The question was, how did they go that far? Well, there's the answer on the screen. It turns out that white tail there also do some seed dispersal. Now, I can tell you from experience that one of the favorite foods of white-tailed deer are trillium. They love to eat what we call the leaves. A little bit later on, we're gonna talk about what we call leaves aren't really leaves. They're actually part of the flower. But they must taste really, really good. Because I have thousands of fresh, young, new, tender leaves on the wildflowers in my yard. They will walk straight up to the trillium simile, nip off the leaves and walk by everything else. But as it turns out, they also go here to eat the fruits as well, carry them off and deposit them sometimes more than a mile away. So we're getting a little bit of dispersal from them as well. Well, I mentioned they're kind of getting a slow start, if you would. You're getting moved around very short distances, but once they get there, they're there for a while. If some of the research has been done, they have found trillium individual trillion that are more than a hundred years old. And I say more than a hundred years old because if you look at the root structure on this, each year they're going to add a new segment, if you would. That's what these areas are pointing out. So the plant, even once it's planted, is slowly moving ahead. It's going to get basically where the stem comes down, it's going to add new growth, then we'll come up a little bit, keeps moving and moving. They have counted over a hundred of these, we'll call them growth ranges, but they don't know how old it was beyond a hundred because the older section had rotted out. So more than a hundred years for a herbaceous plant, trees, that's, you think trees, right? 
And some trees live hundreds, certainly thousands of years, depending on the tree species. A trillion can live over a hundred years, slow to move by sea, but once they get there, they're going to be there for a long time. But when they first pop up, they don't look like a trillium at all. This is a trillium. This is trillium maculatum, what we call sweet Betsy trillium. That's a trillium. That's a trillium. That's a trillium. That's a trillium. They start out with one leaf. And they can stay in that one leaf stage for multiple years, depending upon the condition in which they find themselves. In other words, if it's a good, healthy environment, they can store up a lot of energy and can get bigger and bigger. Because the goal is to put on three leaves. But it's time to get those three leaves on, you can make more food, more surface area, you can photosynthesize more. And you gotta have a lot of energy to reproduce. Okay. That's a great question. If the deer come in and browse on your trillium, is there enough storage in the root for them to come back the next year? Yes and no. It depends upon how much reserve it has in there. As a matter of fact, if you come in and you've got a three leaf stage, and they come back. Then the next year, then they come back as three. But they can also revert back to the one leaf stage. So you may have this beautiful patch of trillium that you go to visit every year. And then you go back and you're like, where did they all go? Because you may or may not have known they have a one leaf stage. And it could have been that there was some disturbance that took place like a deer browsing on. So they can revert back to that. But from that seed, it can take, depending on the species, as many as seven to eight, in some cases, nine years from a seed to you get your first flower. Once again, they're not in too big of a hurry. And as it turns out, no need to be in too big of a hurry if you're going to hang around for 100 plus years, right? All right. This is where it gets even more fun. <laughs> You're thinking about this, this plant, I think it's a, very, a plant filled with mystery. How does it move around? What moves it? How did it move a mile away and for a long time period? You thought they were just moving very short distances. You have the seed in the ground, it comes up as one leaf. It can go back to one leaf. Then it gets even more fun. Is it a lily? Is it in the Liliaceae family or is it in the Triliaceae family? And this is a conversation that has been going on for hundreds of years. Now, I used to present scientific data to a very different audience. And in that case, we were known to put up huge tables and graphs. And we would talk about that one table or that one graph for 15, 20, 30 minutes. Well, I don't do that quite so much anymore. All I really want you to see from this is that you go back to 1789, the Liaceae family. Oh, 1829, a new family. Oh, 1846, the back of Triliaceae. Oh, 1883, Lily, Lily, Lily. Oh, back of Triliaceae. Keep moving our way on down through here. The taxonomy we're going to be following tonight is based on Allen Weekly's flora of the Southeast. They are in the Triliaceae family. Lots of debate that's going on, but that's the taxonomy we're going to be talking about tonight. Even though I know there are many great wildflower books out there, and you go and you look and they tell you it's in the lily band. There's a reason for that. I love this quote. In 1817, the botanist Stephen Elliott did a sketch of the botany of South Carolina and Georgia, had this to say about Trillium. This genus is an interesting one. Under great simplicity and great conformity of habit, three leaves at the summit of a stem supporting one solitary terminal flower. It contains and conceals many species. You may have heard someone say it's easy to get to genus. That's a trillion. Well, turns out not so much. We're going to see a trillium in a little while, if not in the trillium genus. 
So let's get down to the basic of what is a trillion and how it's made up. We're going to look at this as sort of a typical flower pattern. We recognize this is a trillion, as stated in the earlier slide. It's, it's half that you're going to have these three petals on here. You're going to have six of your stamens in here. You have that single ovary in there. You're going to have your sepals in the background. You have these things that are leaves. We call them leaves, but what are they really? Cracks. So everything you see above ground that's not the stem is the flower. But for the purposes of this presentation tonight, we're going to refer to what we call the leaves as being the leaves. All right. But understand that they are they're doing the same function. They're photosynthesizing. That's their primary purpose is to, to make food for the plant. But technically, they're not leaves. Trillium are great, aren't they? This gets more fun. All right. So if we saw this out in the woods as we were walking through, we would certainly recognize this as a trip. All of our nice parts of threes in here. What species is it, though? When you start looking at trillium, it's easy to get to genus. We'll, we'll kind of stay with that. But you're not going to be just looking at the color of the petals. You're going to be looking at the shape of the petals. You're going to be looking at how much they overlap. But you're also going to look at all these structures in the middle. The color of the ovary is it dark. Is it almost a washed out red? Or is it a deep purple to a black? Is it light green to yellow? And you're going to look at these anthers. What color are they? How long are they? What are their shapes? Got the idea? Now, as the gentleman said from the quote earlier from the 1800s, of course, they behave very well. You have one stem coming up and you have one flower. What's going on with this thing? These are what we're going to call tonight. One, two, three leaves. One, two, three leaves. And a flower in the middle. This thing has six leaves. I have seen trilliums with parts of two, parts of three, parts of four, parts of five, and yes, parts of six. Now, this is yellow trillium or trillium mugium. I took this photograph uh, at Greenbrier up in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Huge, huge, huge population of them. And that's what happens when you get large populations. You get those individuals that are like, hey, I'm going to look just a little bit different from everybody else. Now, of course, they're not going to think that, but you have all these recessive genes in there that don't get that opportunity to show themselves. But now you've got this huge population, and now you're just a little different, if you would. When you're looking at trillium, you may have a single stem coming up. We're going to call these the leaves. And the flower sits right on the top. This group we refer to sometimes as the toad shade or the sessile or sessile tree. It's the name of toad shade because most of them, the leaves are going to be modeled like the skin of a toad. <laughs> but I've seen them that they weren't. But you're not going to have a pedestal, a stem in which it has the flower. So these are sessile. You can also have those that are not or erect. They are pedicillate. So you've got your sessile and you have your pedicillate. So you can take all the fern, excuse me, all of the trillium that are out there. You can at least break them down into two major groups. So it makes it a little easier for identification. We're going to start out with some of the toad shade trilliums. This is one that probably most of us in this room recognize. Um, the sweet Betsy trillium gets the common name from sweet because it has a beautiful, very fragrant. To me, it sort of smells like bananas. Each person's different. Somebody told me it smelled like sweethearts one time. Okay. If you go to a huge population of sweet um, Betsy's, the air is just very, very fragrant. Look on here, of course, we can't see the stem coming up. This is Cecil sitting right on the top. 
we've got our model leaves on there, letting us know that we have sweet Betsy trillium. All right. So what's this one then? Coming up, we've got Cecil. Got our model leaves on there. But look at the color of the petals. Are those yellow? The green? That is sweet Betsy Trillium. So it's taken right beside the other picture. Both of them were taken at Station Cove Falls. Every year, I love it. Every year I get at least one email that says, I found Trillium Ludium at Station Cove Falls. Common name for Trillium Ludium is Yellow Trillium. This is another example of a large population that that trillium, so to speak, said, I'm not going to be purple. I'm not going to be maroon in color. But once again, it's those recessive genes that are taking place. That's one of my favorite things about going to large populations of trillium. The Devil's Courthouse on the Blue Ridge Parkway covered with painted trilliums. And in one grouping, you can find them in multitudes of numbers of leaves and petals, but also even in color pattern. I've seen them, well, we'll talk about that later. Well, yeah, <laughs> get excited. All right. This is the trillium ludium that I mentioned before that a lot of times people will confuse this for. Um, when you look at them, they do look very similar, but the difference is where you see it. One of the things that I, I don't want to say always, but I try to always tell people is when you're trying to identify something, be it a trillium, be it a, an iris, be it a bird, the first question you ask is, where did you see it? Because that's going to make a big difference. Because as I mentioned, trillium have a very wide distribution, especially throughout the southeastern United States. However, you're going to find different species of trillium in different locales, including this one. This is faded trillium or trillium discolor. It's another one of our white robin trilliums or our toad shaped trilliums. Sessile, if you will. But look at the shape of the petal on this. Kind of narrow near the base, it comes up and then it rounds off almost like a spoon or a spatula. And because they grow in the headwaters of Savannah River, this photograph was taken at Twin Falls, pretty close to Twin Falls, either there or nine times the river. It was one or the other. But it's the difference in the shape of that petal that helps me know that I'm potentially looking at trillium discolor. Also, by looking at the inside, looking at the color of the anthers, where I've got this red or maroon color, where I've got my yellow on the other side, about how far they extend up from the base. I don't, I don't get too technical. To get the idea, trillium or easy to get to genus, except for painting, which is not a genus trillium. But so what was that? The previous one? Mm -hmm. uh, that was also faded trillium or trillium discolor. Same thing. Yeah, good question. Cane Creek. Cane Creek has lots of them, absolutely. Um, we have relic trillium. And when you start looking at the overall shape, look how much smaller the leaves are on this. That's one of the ways also where you see it at. But notice that you don't have a, 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 a as large a leaf as you have on this color or what you have on Sweet Betsy. Sometimes you'll actually have leaves that overlap on species, which can be helpful as well. And when again, you start looking at the insides, a little different in there. Anthers look the same, but the ovary in this picture case is much darker. So the color of the ovary is going to be important, as I mentioned. Yeah. The stem is very bent and crooked on it. Oh. Yeah, relic trillium has sort of this bent, crooked-looking thing on it. 
but I've seen other ones do that as well. This one is usually easy to identify because it's the shape of the leaf. Lance leaf, very elongated, narrow leaf on there. But also where you see it, you go to Congaree National Park, you will see Lance Leaf Trillium. Let's see, is it at Stevens Creek? Mm -hmm. Yes, Stevens Creek is also another good place. It's also South Carolina Botanical Gardens as well, if you go from the mountains to see on that trail. But that lance shaped leaf. So the leaf shape can be of help in addition to the location of the flower, color of the flower, and the other diagnostics. Oh, this is one of my favorites. This is model trillium for trillium maculatum. <laughs> trillium maculatum. This photograph was taken about two days before Valentine's Day, 11 years ago. Uh, this is a, this photograph was taken about, I could see the ocean. I was standing there and I was looking across the salt marsh and down to my left, I could see the ocean. Blooming right beside a beautiful stand of irises. Give an idea of that. This photograph, if I were to ask you where I was in the state, you could probably don't narrow it down. Look at those palms in the background. All right. Now we're going to move on from the model, excuse me, from the OJ's one sessile trillium. We're going to move on to the pedicillin. It's got a little pedestal. Stem is holding them up. And even with the nose, you get nodding, those that hang down, and you get those that stand up, so nodding and or erect. So that can help you narrow it down as well. This is what we know as Catesby trillium or trillium Catesby. I could probably do multiple hours of presentation just on this particular trillium. Not only I, but many others, those who are studying their genetics to figure out what's going on. Was named in honor of, of Casey, Mark Casey, an early naturalist who came to the Carolinas. Notice in this case, you've got this sort of pink looking flower on it. It's kind of out to the side a little bit. Um, but this particular one can do a lot of different things. Here's what I mean by that. This photograph was taken directly above this. So in other words, this flower is directly above the leaves in comparison to the side of being underneath. I wish I could give you a scientific name for this one. I can't because either they still haven't, either they still haven't figured it out or it hadn't been published yet and the information hasn't been released. But there's a lot of conversation in the world of systematics that KTBI is going to be split into as many as possible three different plants. Trillium KTBI that we know starts out white in color. Then once it's been kissed, it blushes. It turns pink. But we also have Trillium KTBI that bloom pink. No white in there at all, in general. There's going to be differences. And then we have this one that stands up directly above it. It blooms earlier than the blushing Catesby's trillium or the white flowering Catesby's trillium. When it was first, at least to the best of my knowledge and in all the literature, it was first found along the middle Saluda River in South Carolina. And it's not in its headwaters, but very close by in Jones Gap State Park. Since that time, there have been other populations that have been found that we think are Jones Gap trillium as well. It's found in Jones Gap, people refer to it as in Jones Gap trillium. You'll see that in the literature sometimes. It's a little tricky. Not only do a lot of the trillium look very similar to one another, but they will also hide you know, all of us in this room, probably when we were taking uh, biology in high school, we learned that a species was that if you have two individuals that 
reproduce and they have viable offspring, their offspring can also reproduce and that's the species. Well, that definition is out the window. You can get two different species that can hybridize and you end up with something that's a cross between the two of them. So when you start looking at their genetics, you're looking at a mature plant, the genetics can throw you off. You've kind of got to go back, I don't want to get too deep into this, but you kind of got to go back to the early stages of meiosis. And then you've got to do some extraction and it takes a lot of work. But I keep my fingers crossed that someday I'll be able to stand in front of an audience and tell you the three names for the different species that come out of this. But there's lots of debate out there that's still going on. Ah, painted trillium. This is the trillium that's not in the trillium genus that we have. Trillium undulatum. That name has been around for a while. You keep up with scientific names, you know that that genus has been around for a while. But not all of our trillium in the Carolinas are in the trillium genus. Here's a different genus that we have different in South Carolina. Um, and in North Carolina, when I was on the parkway, as well as in the Cavalier Valley, these things were in bloom everywhere. Everywhere. And I was getting all excited about them. And the group that I was with, they were getting excited because I was getting excited. And I said, No, you don't understand. This is a great plant. But, you know, I guess if you're from North Carolina, you might not be as excited about it as us folks from South Carolina did about it. Because in South Carolina, there are only three historic records of populations in the state. Of those three, I only know of one of them that they are still there and still blooming. The two in Sumter National Forest, I've been to those locations and I have not been able to find them. Hopefully, someday they will be relocated. Uh, but as of now, there is one population in South Carolina. And here's why. It's about where you are. And how can you get there? And how can you get there? Exactly. Painted trillium in general is around 3,000 plus feet above sea level. Most of the literature is going to tell you it's between three feet and five. And it depends on your latitude, where you are. And it also depends. I talk about topography. If you're, if you're deep down in a, a gorge, like when I was over in Catalucci Valley, higher elevation, not 4,000, but it was in that code. So, therefore, you had conditions that were more akin to being in higher elevations. In South Carolina, we don't have anything above 4,000 feet, but we do have a few places that, because of the topography plus the elevation, have conditions. That allow any trillion to be able to survive there. As I mentioned on the Blue Ridge Parkway, the Devil's Courthouse, I've seen these things in all sorts of multitudes, including double flowers. They had six petals. I've seen them with no coloration. By the way, these are pollen guys. They are like lights on the runway for insects. That's what blue coloration helps with. Focus in the pollinators are coming in, the insects, the beetles, um, the hymenopterans, the wasps, and so forth. But I've seen a little happen. What's the advantage to that? May not be much advantage because the majority have the painting on them. And you're going to get all variety. You're going to get much deeper, almost burgundy. But also the scientific name of undulatum. Look at the size of the petals, how they undulate. You don't see that in a lot of other trillium. Even the leaf edge undulates as well. Therefore, hence, large flower trillium, trillium grandiflor, North Carolina has a lot. South Carolina. <laughs> is it random form? Is it a cross of random form and something else? 
And then grant the form indicates you it is the um, has a very large flower on that particular one. Also, want you to notice that it's yellow ovary and yellow anthers in here with a white inflorescence. That's going to be important. Beautiful, beautiful plant. <coughs> Code Hardwood Trail, Great Smoky Mountains, just outside of Sugarland, Julie Slater, and Jay. Yes, I, I, I've seen plants that are close to three feet tall or more. All right, we have another of our nodding trillium that's white petals. This is Southern Nodding Trillium. But look inside the flower. White petals, but now we have a darker ovary. We have this almost the same color of anthers with a white line down through the middle. Very different from yellow and the um, yellow to greenish ovary that we saw in Brandon Floral. Now, this is one that's pretty distinctive. If you've ever seen this in bloom, you know what this one is. What is this? That's right. And the name's up there. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> I am known to give people the answer to my questions in my questions. Dan calls them timidism. All right. Bassie's trillium, beautiful. I saw some of these today. I went out for about an hour walk. Didn't have much time being for it. I got out there for about an hour. Beautiful. The flowers on these things are huge. I've seen them probably close to two inches across, or maybe a little bit more. Oh, stay on the right trigger. Sorry about that. There it is up close. All right, now we have a woodpecker in the room, maybe outside. All right, this is sweet white trillium, and I love the scientific name Trillium simile. Somebody had a really good sense of humor when they named this. Trillium simile because it is similar to many other white flowering trillium. But one of the ways in which you tell the difference for most of them is look at the white petals. Now we have a dark ovary and we've got yellow. Or if this was truly grandiflora, we would we'd have a yellowish to green ovary in it. They grow, in some cases, right beside each other. There are some other characteristics that will help you identify it, but that's one of the almost easiest ways to tell. Because, just for fun, we have another white flowering trillium with a dark center with yellow anthers. But notice the petals are much more narrow on this particular one. And by the way, this is red trillium that I'm on the camera right now. What's wrong with that picture? <laughs> what color is it? It's not red. When it was named, this is the color of flowers that they were seeing. Notice it looks very similar in the center. All the other characters, everything matches up even the DNA matches up. But yes, Trillium erectum can have red flowers or it can have white flowers in the same population growing side by side. Um, these were taken at heading out to Cleanman's Dome. I'm up in the Smokies. There's a pull off there on the right. You can access the Appalachian Trail down there. I can't think of them in a pull off. These things are growing right in the parking lot when they're in a crab apple tree. Huge population. All right, so now I have tried to show you some ways to possibly recognize and identify them. Uh, but Jane Marlowe is going much further than that. You can go to name that plant, and, and Jane has on there some basic keys that are set up on there. This is, will not be interactive tonight because I don't have it. This is just a, a screenshot. But you can go in and go to that key, and then you will it'll ask you if the leaves are modeled in different shades of green. Can't see that top, but I apologize. It's hidden back there. Um, but if you click on that, you can come down and ask if the flowers born on stalks 
In other words, whether they're conditional or they cessor without stop underneath. Then you hit submit. And in this case, I just asked it for this, and it lists me all the possibilities that are there. You can go in and ask it more. The pedals with a coarse texture, prominent net veins, not wavy margin, which is what I chose. And it said, okay, these are your options. Northern nodding, trillium, bent trilliums, southern nodding, and some other species. By the way, that site is North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, because obviously Emma, the Lola trillions in Georgia. All right. So what questions can I answer for you? <laughs> can I explain why painted trillium is in a different genus? It's trillium. I can, it's, it's going to be, it's based a lot on the genetics of the particular one. It's not something you're going to see. And it dates back to some of the earlier, the, the Trilliaceae family, depending upon the time period, something the Trilliaceae family um, has had as many as, as six different genera. Um, you know, and we're talking about plants, we've been talking about the Carolinas. But when you get into the Trilliaceae family, there is more than just the Trillium and the Trillidium. There are other genera as well. But in our area, that's what we have. That's going to be based on genetics. I can give you a link to a couple of studies, but it, it's, it's a whole lot of DNA. Sure. We have 50, approximately 50 species of Trilliaceae in North America. Roughly half of those are in the southeastern part of the United States. We can talk about how it's very true. We have so much diversity within the southern Appalachian Mountains and within the southeast of, of North America. The greatest diversity of the Trillium genus is in the southeast. And by the way, the greatest diversity within the southeast is the Savannah River drainage base. They're right here in our backyard, too far away. Others are in different locations around the world. So in multiple places. Trillium? No. No, the trillium, the tri the trillium genus is North America. And throw the trillium in there for this painting. What, what other questions can I answer for you? Is trillium monotypic? There are other species. We're in the literature, it depends on the day of the week you're reading. At least with, one of the great things with technology is, as many of you know, by the time things go into print, they're out of date. Um, on a computer, you can change things and update them pretty quick. So by the time you get into the latest and the greatest, it's already only news by the time this is a publication. How many species do you have in the mountain? How many species of trillium? It depends on if you're a lump or a splitter. <laughs> I mean, I think both are good. Splitters mean you're going to break it down to the nitty gritty, like HBI is don't get trillium or. Things of that nature. See, we have sweet mountain sweet Betsy trillium. We have what we call the Jones Gap trillium. And we have Bassett trillium. We have three. Can't tell you that. I can tell you that there are painted trilliums in the same South Carolina. So, same question in the range of the uh, thyroid, particularly. Rick, any idea? There's not a genetic thing. Thyroid, the Piedmont species. As far as the Tiger River drainage in terms of Tiger River watershed, I don't know how many 
species I, of trillium. I, I don't know what I know. There's a lot of them here. There, there are a lot of them, but I, I do not know. I'm more familiar with the Savannah River drainage basin, but I don't. And that uh, the relic trail that you mentioned, you know, that's that on that, that Savannah River love. You know, so it is. Yeah, I've done some population survey. Mm -hmm. Yes. In case you said that some of them don't start off like they're all the that never changes in the certain population. Um, well, I was saying that the question was if you have a big population of KCI, can you have those that bloom pink and those that bloom white? Like, I, I, that could be a possibility. I've never seen it. Usually, if it's a population of them, they bloom one color or the other. You said start like maturity, and then some of them are similar. Mm -hmm. those, those two are not like that. I want to say that's the high. When the, the individual ones that bloom pink, bloom pink every time. And you can take your seeds and plant them and they'll bloom. So it's not a recessive gene that's associated with a larger population. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. How much of a variation is there on where they grow? Um, the type of soil, the type of light? Um, okay, yes, good question. The trillium are, they bloom early before the trees leaf out. They are predominantly going to be in forested areas. They don't do direct sunlight very well at all. They do need at least some model sunlight. You also depends on, we were in spruce fir forest the other day. I've, I've never seen a trillium in a spruce fir forest. I don't know that you can hear spruce fir forest. Other, others may happen. I've never seen it, but that's because you get a different wavelength of light moving through there versus when you're in a, in a hardwood forest. So they're going to grow in the shade. The majority of them are going to grow in acidic soils. But there are those that like circumneutral soil or sweet soil. And there are those that like calcium in their soil. But the ones that like calcium in their soil don't grow well in other situations when they're not calcium in the soil. And that's going to have to do with the geology of that particular area. They like moist environments. I don't know of any species of trillium that grows in xeric environments. They're going to be in moist environments in the shade. And the majority are going to be in acidic soils. When I lived in my house in 2004, and I came back in the house, it was very, it's the morning sun. And they're in clay. And those things get spread off. Yeah, they can take morning sun, sure. They just love. Yeah, they can take morning sun. And clay is going to be acidic. Yeah. And you know, the plants don't read the books that we read. So sometimes they show up in weird places like, why is that here? How did that get here? They're, and they're a lot harder than you think. They're, they are very hardy. And some of the trillium are not easy to grow. As a matter of fact, painted trillium is probably the most picky to try to grow. First time I saw it, I don't think that was usually Oh, maybe fine on a city soil. They want well drained, but they want to be what they, they want some rain. Well drained soils. Is it more acidic than most? Not more, not, not, it's not more acidic than other soils, but the majority of our soils in the Carolinas are going to be acidic unless you yeah. once again have some geological formation in there that's going to you know, have, have magnesium, like an amphibolite or calcium associated with harsh topography and things like that. Yes. Uh, heard the fire ants because of the way they uh, feed on the uh, livestock um, actually can destroy trillium seed. Is that something that you've heard as well and have you had experience with that? If so, how much of an impact is that having on trillium population? Oh, that is a really good question. With the introduction of fire ants, come, of course, they will they will kill other 
native ants. So you're removing your native ants that will receive dispersers. So it's not only affecting the trillium, but other plants that their seeds or ant dispersed. So you're removing part of them. There is some data to support that the way that fire ants they damage the seed from those plants, including trillium, and therefore they're not viable. I'm not aware of any research out there right now. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I'm not aware of any research out there that giving any indication about how it's affected trillium populations in the area. But that is a great question. I love the program when I go home with at least one question. I know it was a good program, so I'm going to do some research on that. Thank you. All right, I got time for maybe one or two more questions. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Why is the grass Who? Why is the greatest diversity of trillium in the Savannah River drainage basin? There's, there's probably a number of answers to that, the factors to that. There's no one in particular thing. In general, what you have in the southeastern United States, depending upon where you are, especially as you move more inland, for example, um, we didn't get glaciated. So, you know, we have long, you know, at least last peak of the last, I'd say, 25,000 years ago. So we've had a, a long time period in which we didn't have any glacier impact directly. Um, a lot of the State, depending upon where you were, hasn't been under salt water for quite some time. And then we have that, once again, that antiquity that's going on in there. You get this isolation species at the flowering plants and, and other organisms were moving back north once the glacier began to, to melt. Some of them went ahead and headed back up north, but several of them ended up in, in these islands. 